Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. What an exciting week. Graduation happened yesterday. Very excited about graduation. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. Today is uh, Q&A. You know, we get a lot of questions uh, over the month, and I would like to every now and then stop and just pause and answer the questions that you have. And, of course, I'll start with a disclaimer. I don't represent the CDC, the federal or state government, or the home office in Ames, Iowa. It's just my opinions based on the reading that I do and what I think is right. But I got a lot of really great questions, uh, and I think hopefully we've selected the ones that I think will be most relevant to m most of the people. So the, probably the most important question, the one I get all the time, especially from my sister, is, is it safe for fully vaccinated people to go out and, and, and gather, uh, it's particularly indoors, now that the CDC has said it's okay? Uh, and can we get together in groups of more than 100? And I, this is also, people have asked about church gatherings, uh, worshiping, singing, things like that. So <laughs> the answer is yes and no. So uh, the CDC says, you know, if you're vaccinated, it's okay. The problem is that if you sort of do risk, what's the biggest risk? A large gathering of people singing and yelling. Those are the things that we know in the beginning of the pandemic really were good, very efficient in transmitting virus between people. So that coral outbreak in Minnesota, uh, large gatherings in, in schools, uh, in military bases. So, you know, it's, it's a little bit difficult. And I, I remind everybody, only half of the adult population in the United States has been vaccinated. Another way of saying that is 50% has not been vaccinated. So there's a lot of people out there at high risk. And it's not because they don't want to. Kids are not yet eligible under the age of 12. You know, and some people haven't had access to the vaccine, even though they want it. So I'm not willing to just say everything is fine. I think we have to be a little bit more thoughtful. But let's, let's think about it. As of May 17th, and this is how the C CDC does it. It accumulates data and then says, oh, as of May 17th, there, be, there were over 123 million people fully, fully vaccinated. That means, you know, two shots, two weeks after, one shot of J&J, &J, two weeks after. We're, we're farther ahead now. We're, we're almost up to 50%. But th back then, they tabulated the data. And at that point, there had been 1,949 breakthrough hospitalizations and fatalities. That means fully vaccinated, but people still were hospitalized, uh, and some died. Most of them were over the age of 65, and about 25% of, of those 1,900 were really detected because people were coming to the hospital for other reasons. So they weren't hospitalized because of COVID. They were hospitalized to have something done, and they detected COVID before a procedure, something like that. 353 people have died, uh, and about 20% of those were also probably unrelated to COVID. But it, it, the point is that even though these vaccines are incredibly effective, we're still at, you still can get it. If they're 95% effective, that means you, you, some people will still get it. To put in that in perspective, there have been about 10,000 breakthrough infections, but those have been asymptomatic. In other words, they were just detected. Uh, and the CDC right now isn't even collecting data on those anymore. If, you're, if you've been vaccinated and, you have, you know, and you're found to be carrying the virus, no, they don't even follow up on you. So my, my suggestion is, uh, I personally feel uncomfortable uncom in large crowds. I am not yet ready to go hang out at, a, at, a, at an indoor stadium with 20,000 people. It's a personal decision about uh, whether you want to go to services. Uh, you know, if everyone's vaccinated, I'd feel perfectly comfortable. If you don't know and 50% of the people haven't been vaccinated, I'd, be, I'd feel pretty uncomfortable. So, you know, what I'd like to see is a lot of the churches and synagogues and religious groups getting together and making sure their, pa their patrons are vaccinated. That's, that would be the best thing you could do. Make sure people are vaccinated. Encourage them. Say, look, we can attend if you're vaccinated, something like that. Anyway, it's a personal decision. I personally am not hanging out in groups of over 100 just yet. When we get to about 60% of the population vaccinated, and in our community, the viral burden is very low and we're down to 50, 60 cases a day, not 300 or 400. I feel more comfortable getting in with groups. And, you know, and frankly, it's going to take us all a little bit of time. This has been a traumatic thing for us. 
we're all going to have to get used to interacting. I don't know what, when I run into people now, I, I don't know whether to shake hands, fit, you know, fist bump, hit their elbows, I don't know. And we're all getting back into it. So it's going to take a while, and that's perfectly normal. I, I think we should all feel perfectly comfortable. So there's another question. The guidelines over fully vaccinated maskless individuals are very confusing, particularly around kids. What's your advice? Well, I, I think until kids are fully vaccinated, they're at risk, you know, and, and so I don't think we should really change anything. I mean, pretty much if you don't have, if you haven't been vaccinated as an adult or you have kids that are unvaccinated, all the guidelines really kind of stay the same. The difference is if there are adults in the house that are vaccinated and they have kids that are unvaccinated, you all can hang around together because you're not really at, you're not going to provide much risk to, to kids. And if you have pods, you know, you have two friends that you know are all vaccinated and you've all been close together, getting your kids together to, to be indoors, I'd feel pretty comfortable with that. Uh, I think the hardest thing to deal with is what do we do for camps? Uh, again, it's a personal decision, but I would personally want to make sure that all the counselors and everybody, all the adults are vaccinated, that kids are treated in pods, that for indoor activities, if they're unvaccinated, they're wearing masks. For outdoor activities, there's been very little transmission uh, outdoors. But, you know, if they're just playing on a field, fine, don't wear masks. But if they're all clustered together in some, you know, event, I, I, then I, I think they should wear masks. But again, you'd want to talk to the camp and make sure that everything is going along the way you want it. This, this was an interesting question. I'm very afraid of resurgence of the pandemic that this, uh, because so many unvaccinated people now are going maskless and it, it will hurt uh, and hit the vulnerable communities the hardest. So, I, you know, I agree with the concerns. If you look at uh, there was an interesting article in the New York Times. They said, okay, everybody's vaccinated. You know, they're doing fine. We look at the total case number going down. But if you look at the case number in people who are unvaccinated, it's just a peak just like it has been in the past. So people who are unvaccinated are still getting sick. So it's not really, it's not really fair because those people are going to continue to be vulnerable and will get sick. I don't think we will have a giant fourth wave just because I don't think there's enough people. As we get to 50 to 60 percent, we have, I think, hit essentially what is herd immunity because even despite the fact that we're not following public health measures anymore, the case number is trickling down. But almost all of those cases are in people who are unvaccinated. So if they would just get vaccinated, they could protect themselves and it would really have a big impact in the country. And this is a good one. How do I convince my fully vaccinated adult children that the Pfizer vaccine is safe enough to give to their own children, th three of whom are ages 12 to 14? They worry about the long-term effects. I'm, wor I'm worried about the long-term effects of COVID. Uh, you know, that's a real problem. There have been a f very few side effects. There's been a couple of cases uh, reported of uh, mild myocarditis in people, in young kids who've been vaccinated. But the, the virus gives them that. The virus has been shown to give myocarditis and cardio dysfunction, pulmonary disease, and, and children have died from COVID. I would just, the risk to me is, is too great for kids. I would definitely get them vaccinated. I don't know how you convince them. I mean, it's kind of like, is it good enough for them? Why is it good enough for their own kids? It kind of seems a little hypocritical to say, I want to get vaccinated, but you guys, you kids, you're, you're not getting vaccinated. Oh, this is a good one. You said that no one has died from the vaccine, but I've heard that 3,000 deaths have been attributed to the vaccine. Uh, so what's, what's with that? Okay, well, that's, that's not exactly, that's not correct. Uh, I, did, I did say no, one has been, no, no deaths have been attributed to the vaccine. There have been deaths. So there have been over 273 million uh, doses as of May 17th. Uh, and they, we have a, a adverse reporting event system. There, any side effect can be reported to this adverse system. And in those in those cases, there have been close to 5,000 uh, reported, uh, 4,500 or so reported complications and deaths. Every one of those is reviewed. Every single one of those is re reviewed by the CDC and another physician. And you try to say and attribute it, is it attributed to the, the, the vaccine or not? So, you know, somebody says, well, I, I knew someone who got the vaccine and dropped dead immediately. Well, when you do an autopsy and they have to look at autopsies and everything, and it turns out the person had three vessel heart disease and cardiac disease and, all, and had two episodes before a, a ventricular tachycardia. Well, it's, you don't attribute that to the vaccine. People are going to die. The people die all the time. 
and you have to be able you have to be able to attribute the the actual death to the vaccine, and that, and there've been none, none. Uh, that's not true of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. There have been about 28 or 30 cases of the rare clotting disorder, uh, which we now think is an autoimmune response. Uh, now, how to treat it now? But those have been attributed to the vaccine. So it's not like we're not attributing things to the vaccine, but every case has to be reviewed. And so there will be people who get vaccinated and within two weeks pass away. But it's, it's probably not due to the vaccine. It's almost, it's never been attributed to the vaccine. Why did CDC change their recommendations at this time? <laughs> I, I, CDC cut us all by surprise. I mean, you know, it was very conservative, very conservative, very conservative, then throw away your mask. It was like, well, wait a minute. And, and I think it put us all in a really bad position, particularly business owners. I mean, you know, the, the essential services like grocery stores and, and drug stores, those people were really doing a good job saying, you can't come in here unless you've got a mask on. Well, if the CDC says, C says uh, you know, you don't have to wear a mask if you're vaccinated, all of a sudden, the people in grocery stores have to be the you know the mask police. Well, that doesn't work out. So that was really, really hard for them. I, and I applaud those stores that are continuing to say, look, wear a mask because we don't want to make, you know, we don't want to ask people, you know, who's been vaccinated, who hasn't. So it did catch us all uh, by surprise. Scientifically, it was a correct thing to do, but administratively, it, to operationalize that, <laughs> they should have done it differently. They should have had it gradually uh, you know, change. And, and I think they should have kept essential services like uh, food stores, uh, uh, drug stores, probably should have kept the mask order on and thought about what it would mean to the you know, small business owners uh, trying to do these things uh, with, with the CDC saying, throw it away. A person can walk in and say, well, the CDC told me I'm not wearing my mask. Well, you know, then you have to say, have you been vaccinated? You know, it's, it's, it just, it, it was not good. I, I think it was not administratively done very well. Good question here. How long will the COVID-19 vaccine last? And are we going to need to take it every year or are we going to need a booster? Well, so far it's lasted a pretty long time. I and mean, it's been, we have examples of people having, uh, you know, been vaccinated over a year and they're not getting reinfected. Uh, we are following uh, their, uh, the antibody levels in people and they do tend to wane. So I do think over time, uh, there probably will be a need for a booster. Uh, remember, the current vaccines, uh, except for AstraZeneca, the, all the current vaccines are good for all the variants too. But with the variants, they're slightly less effective. So that means there's more likely you would have, uh, you know, an, an infection even, even though you were vaccinated. None of those people tend to have severe, you know, tends to be fairly uh, mild infections. So we don't know until we actually begin to see it wear off and people get reinfected. But my guess is that within a year or so, We'll probably have a booster, and it'll probably be to some of the variants, like the South African variant uh, and maybe the Brazilian variant. Those are the two that seem to be most likely to escape. And as I mentioned last week, there, or yeah, last week, um, there's a real promising uh, studies by Bart Haynes' group showing that we might be close to having a universal vaccine. And if that were the case, that would be ideal to give to people uh, in a year or two. Uh, when will the COVID vaccine become fully authorized? Really great question. So. The process in the FDA is you collect six months of data after you start after it's been approved emergency use approval, and that six months of data is then submitted to the FDA and it's reviewed. And what they really review is every single complication. So, I mentioned those five thousand deaths. They're going to have to look at every one of those and and see whether or not it's true or they believe it's true that it was not attributed to the vaccine. It's really a safety monitoring event, and then it usually takes six months to get that approved. Well, they, they'll do an accelerated one, and accelerated review usually takes four months. So, you know, let's say it's <laughs> ultra, extra special accelerated. Maybe it'll be two or three months. But uh, Pfizer just submitted their package because in May, mid-May, it had been six months since the introduction of the, of the vaccine. They will be asking for approval. They have asked for approval. The FDA will review that information. I, I would hope that by mid-summer to late summer, it's approved by the FDA. And then I think businesses will, will be in a much better position to say that they, if they want to mandate vaccines for their people, if it's FDA approved, it's a lot easier to do than if, if it's under an emergency use authorization. So I'm hopeful by the fall, at least, both Pfizer and Moderna are fully approved by the FDA. Do you know for sure that the vaccine is effective in kids? Uh, yes. So both Moderna and Pfizer have done studies in uh, over 12-year-olds, and they are all the 
all the cases were in the non-vaccinated group, and none of the kids uh, in the vaccinated group got infected. So it seems to be very, very uh, effective. So that's good news. We're, studies are now ongoing for six months to 12. Uh, I heard the survival rate in children is over 99%. Is that correct? That is correct, but a giant but. So this is data from the American Association of Pediatrics. There have been about 4 million uh, documented cases of, of uh, COVID in kids. There have been about 16,000 hospitalizations and 300 deaths. So, you know, yes, it's a very small percent, but a small percent of a big number means they're kids that get infected, get hospitalized, and get sick, which is why I still think if it was my kid, I'd want to be very uh, conservative and make sure he's wearing a mask, especially since it's so close. We're going to have vaccines available for, the, for all age groups, I, I think, by the fall. So just hang on for a few more months, follow the rules, and you know, let's not take any chances with kids. Okay, what happens if you miss the second dose of vaccine? I hated that question because I know you're thinking about not getting the second dose. The, the, please don't do that. Get your second dose. The reason it's important is you want the highest titer possible because that the highest titer of antibodies, even if it's not 100% effective or as effective against the original strain, you need a high titer to be effect, titer to be effective against the South African and the United Kingdom strain, which is the main the main strain in the United States, the United Kingdom strain. So, you want your antibodies, get that booster shot. Don't don't put it off. Please. Uh, what are the chances of uh, spreading asymptomatically after a vaccine? That's a really good question. We don't really know uh, because we're not routinely uh, surveilling people. But, you know, there was that case of the New York Yankees. Uh, one of the coaches got, had not been vaccinated, got sick, and infected eight of the members of the staff. We would never have known that because they were all asymptomatic. But because they were doing a surveillance of the team, they found eight players who were positive even though they'd been vaccinated. So it is possible to spread the virus uh, from an infected person. We don't, my guess is all eight of those players were infected by the person who was not vaccinated. We don't know if any of them who were vaccinated could spread it to others. It's a theoretical possibility. Uh, it is possible you, you do have viruses detected in each of them. The viral loads are pretty low, so they're not likely uh, to be as, as big spreaders. They're not coughing, hacking up stuff. Uh, they have a low viral burden. They're not going to be all that infectious, but it's theoretically possible, which is why, you know, I'm still cautious around people who have not been vaccinated. How well does the vaccine work in immunocompromised people? So that's a really good question. We've had, we finally have one study out of the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation that showed that people who, have, who are on immunosuppression do get a, a response to the vaccine and uh, it's not quite as strong as the others, but it's, it's, it's good. It's enough to be protective. So it looks like they'll pretty soon, my guess is, this will be approved for immunocompromised patients as well. <laughs> my sister, once again, who wants to leave town as fast as possible, get out of New York. She goes, is it safe to fly planes? Now, is it safe to, be, to fly in airplanes? I, and and I've, I've talked about this early on in the pandemic. Uh, most planes are really very safe, uh, as long as people are wearing masks. Early, early on, there were several international flights where people got infected. They were not wearing masks. And there was reason. They were all in close proximity, all within a few rows of each other. They were long flights, international flights. Since the uh, adoption of mask orders, there really hasn't been any outbreaks. And then I reviewed all the different airplanes, high uh, ventilation rate, 97% air exchange every two minutes. They're almost like being outdoors. So the airplanes have actually turned out to be pretty safe. Not all airplanes. So those little, little tiny old Embraers, the regional jets, the little old ones, they, they, they're trying to retrofit those with uh, HEPA filters and all, but most of the modern jets, the Boeing, Airbus, the newer Embraer 175s, those are all uh, a very high exchange rate and all pretty safe, as long as people are wearing their masks. So my sister, again, these are all for my sister. What about travel to Europe? I want to go to Europe. So, me too. <laughs> so it, Europe just announced that they're opening up. They haven't decided exactly when. They keep saying they're going to as a block open up. But uh, uh, France has already said that uh, it's going to open up June 9th. Italy says it's going to open up you know, as in May. So I think what we'll, we'll find is Europe will be pretty much uh, open. So uh, Greece is opening up. Iceland is opening up. Uh, the European Union announced that they will come up with a date where they're all as a block going to open up. 
And then the, the last one I want to just mention because it's come up in the news, what, what's the origin of the virus? So as I said, the, the, the actual viral origin, there's no question in my mind that it happened in nature. What's interesting is, well, how did it go from being a, an infectious uh, virus in, in nature to jumping, you know, and actually being spread into a pandemic? I had mentioned people who live in the vicinity of, bat, of uh, horseshoe bat caves have antibodies to the coronavirus. So they're getting infected, but they're not spreading it because they didn't acquire that one really important spike protein from what looks like the pangolin. Then it became infected. My guess is it's been around for a bit, but just hasn't spread. There was an interesting study that came out from a student in China about uh, six miners who got infected in 2012, who three of whom died. And it sounded very much like it could have been a coronavirus precursor to this one or similar or, or maybe even identical, but we don't know because it wasn't sequenced at that time. What d does happen, and this is what the Wuhan Institute does, is it collects coronaviruses all over and, and um, stores them, studies them, and, and that's what we do with all kinds of viruses. That's what they do in Brazil with dengue. That's what we do with Chagas. That's, we do that. That's what people, we're studying them to try and figure out ways to protect people. So, you know, one, the, when the WHO first investigated the Wuhan Institute, uh, there, was, they, there was no evidence that anybody got sick, so it didn't seem like it could have been, a, could have been an outbreak from people in the lab. Now it's, it's possible that three people were sick. That was the report. It's not been confirmed. So that's what all the, the news is in, the, it, it, all the stuff in the news. Maybe it, was, it, it came from a lab. I, I really find that hard to believe. Uh, my guess is it was circulating in Wuhan, in that province, because of horseshoe bats. There's probably a couple of times it got into people. It's so infectious that had those six miners actually had that virus, it's hard for me to believe it didn't spread to others. So my guess is it wasn't exactly the same virus. Uh, and once this thing caught hold, it took off. And people go, why in Wuhan, where the institute is? Well, that's where all the, <laughs> that's where all the horseshoe bats are. It's like, why is dengue fever in Brazil? It's because that's where it is. That's where all the mosquitoes are. So I, I still think it, this is a thing that came out in the wild, and there's a lot of hoopla going on. But, uh, you know, I do think it's worth studying. We, we like to always, virus hunters like to go and study what's the origin. When, when did it first start? No question, I think, that it evolved in the wild. But when did it first start? How did it get in demand? Is something we should be studying. Anyway, uh, we're, we're coming up on a long uh, weekend. I always like to remind people it's been a tough year. Take some time off. Uh, and let's not uh, forget why we have a three-day holiday. We're, ce we're celebrating Memorial Day. Let's honor the men and women who died while serving in the U.S. military. I mean, no, you know, no greater sacrifice is given by any citizen than uh, to the military. And when, they're, when they die, we honor them. And Memorial Day is the time to do that. Let's focus on that. As Americans, we can all do that together. Whether you're right or left, you can all agree to honor the people who have died for our country. Uh, and then the other thing is, we had graduation. So congratulations to all of our medical graduates. You know, it's, I'm very proud of the fact that we turn out physicians that practice in the, in the state of Texas and in Harris County, but all over the country. It's an important thing we do. Uh, our graduate students, we, we graduate our graduate students, our medical genetics folks, really important contribution. But we also graduated our middle schools, uh, Ryan and Rusk, and the DeBakey High School, and all of our, uh, all of our affiliated schools in South Texas. So congratulations to all the graduates. Great weekend. Have a wonderful holiday, Memorial holiday. And my favorite graduate of all seems to have graduated successfully. And we'll see a little bit of that. Hope to see you soon, and I will see you next week. You went to class. You focused on your studies. You completed your labs. Most of the time. You matched. Three, two, one. Now it's your big day. Lily Klotman receiving her doctorate with highest honors.